Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Simon. I'm a software engineer at uh, Criteo, an ad retargeting company. And today I want to share you of exp our experience with uh, using Wattovec at a very large scale. So first, I would like to know who knows what Wattovec here in the room and who actually used it in production. Yeah. OK, so quite a lot of people, but I'll still do an introduction about what is Wattovec. So Wattovec is an algorithm that was originally invented by Google researchers in an NLP context. And the goal is to be able to compute similarities between words. Like, uh, and to do so, what they do is like they compute a mathematical representation of each word, like a high dimensional vector, and then um, they try to place it in this high dimensional vector. Here the dimension is two, which is not very high, but for the ease of representation, I'll keep this way. And the goal then is to be able to group the, the representation of words with similar meaning together so that we are able to uh, compute di distances over words. So here we have fast, speed, instantaneous, house, building, idle, lazy, like different cluster of, of, uh, of words. And how does it work, actually? How do we learn where to put the words into this high dimensional space? That's the question. So it, use, it uses training data. Well, let's use a very simple training data, like a simple sent sentence, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. What it does, so it first uh, attributes uh, an embedding, so uh, a high dimensional vector, to each word and place them randomly in the space. So here I have quick jump, etc. Everything is random. And then what it does is like it picks a word, well the first word or the second word, and select it, and then it masks the surrounding words. So here the previous and the uh, and the next word, it masks them, and it has the algorithm to predict these surrounding words. So it's like, hey, I have the word quick. What uh, do you think is more probable to 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 be before? And then uh, to answer this question, the algorithm looks at the closest word to the quick, actual quick word representation. And then it, tr it uh, figures out if it got it wrong or not. If it, it got it right, then it changed nothing. If it got it wrong, then it modify the position of the, uh, of the embedding so that the word to be predicted gets closer to the actual representation. So here, we are going to move the, the embeddings slightly closer, and we do the same thing for brown, because this was the next word. But what we actually also do is like, we also move the quick, quick word so that it gets closer to the other ones. And finally, uh, jumped was really close to quick here, and we don't want to be uh, that close, because in this context, it's not really relevant. So we pull this away. So we have uh, here a gradient, like we know how to update our, our weights. And then we move, we move the, the corresponding embeddings. And then we have done one step of the algorithm, and we move to the other step by selecting the next word, brown, and we do the same thing, like updating our weights, and so on, and so on. And at the end, we'll get groups, cluster of words, like here in this specific sentence, like fox is really related to quick and brown, dog is related to lazy, jumped is somehow neutral, and the is also neutral. And as told you, we do this over and over, and the point is that to help the algorithm converge, we reduce the size of the displacement over the time to be sure that it converges. Um, so this what to make algorithm has proven to be extremely successful in the NLP context, and many people started to use it in other contexts. And uh, we at Criteo, we do uh, ad retargeting. This is what I told you. So what we do actually is like we display ads to the user, and then we place products inside these ads. And we, uh, we bill our clients only if the user click on the product. So we, we have a really strong incentive to uh, place relevant products inside our ads. And we thought, hey, could we use this word to back to improve our product recommendation. And by doing a simple analogy, we managed to do this. So the analogy is the following. Like, instead of talking about words, we'll consider products. 
and instead of considering sentences, we'll consider user sessions. So for instance, here we have a user sessions that we capture for our trackers. So we have one user and he has been uh, he has seen an iPhone and then a headset and then trousers, t-shirts, etc. And so this is our new sentence. And then uh, we can apply exactly the same algorithm, try to pick head the headphone, try to uh, predict which, uh, words, uh, which product are going to be in the next one and the previous one. And we, this way, uh, we can place the product inside a high dimensional uh, space and then figure out that these are closes and they are, these are close together, and these products are high tech products and these are close together. The point is that we work at a very large scale. And uh, to give you uh, another magnitude, like f uh, we have to process 120 uh <coughs> billion words or billion events. Uh, and to give you another magnitude, like if you f figure out Wikipedia, then uh, it's almost for the whole Wikipedia in whole languages, this is four times less events, is to give you an example. So in the original implementation of what to vec, it was a simple binary distributed, well, uh, distributed over the web where you could only train it on a single desktop. So it obviously doesn't fit here, it will take forever. So we have to distribute this computation. Luckily, uh, Spark, Apache Spark, uh, and the uh, as in his MLlib uh, project, an implementation of the of a distributed word to vec. I'll explain you how it works. So, the problem is the following: we have now many user stations, and we also have many computers, and we want to compute embeddings for these user stations using the cluster of machines that we have. What we do is actually what the algorithm do is actually pretty simple. Well. It split the timelines and create some partitions for uh, corresponding to the number of nodes that you have to process. And then it sends this data over one single computer each time. It computes embeddings. So like each computer is seeing slightly different products in a different order. So the computed embeddings are slightly different. And then it merges them by simply averaging them. So by doing so, obviously, you lose some quality because each computer had only partial knowledge of the full distribution, but somehow it works. So it was uh, all good. Like we had our data, we had the algorithm, and we had the distribution using Apache Spark. So we'll, we'll thought, hey, we'll run on it. We have also a very large cluster, more than 1,000 nodes. Like, shouldn't be a problem at all. We'll run it and should work. And obviously, it crashed. And, uh, and to figure out, well, we had to figure out why. And the point is like, OK, we were able to scale and had, uh, were able to uh, do computation over, over or tons of events, etc. But actually, the, the limitation was the number of unique products that we had. Uh, so we have around 1 billion unique products. And if you consider the implementation that I've described somehow here, uh, you have to have all the embeddings corresponding to all the different products in memory because you want to be able to update the weights pretty fast. And if you put them in, in, a, in a disk, then it will take forever again. So you have to have everything in memory and then uh, for each single node. So as we had one million nodes, it couldn't fit and we couldn't buy machines to be able to have such a RAM that it would fit in it. So we had a problem. So how did we solve it? So we had a closer look at these timelines. Let's go back to this one. And we thought, hey, here we have a user. He has been to a high tech website. And then he has moved to uh, a fashion website. Actually, does it make sense to be able to compute a similarity between this headphone and these trousers? We thought. For us, this is absolutely not relevant. First, I don't know exactly what it would mean. Plus, in our specific case, we don't display ads uh, for different clients. Like, we decide to display an ad for Gap, and then we pick 
clothes. We don't mix headphones and clothes. So we, we say, oh, what if we split the user sessions with the different clients? So we have now for gi one given user, we have one timeline for the uh, for the clothes and one timeline for the for the high tech. We learn embeddings for the clothes, and then we are able to detect that t-shirts come together, and then the trousers are slightly different, and same thing for the headsets. And by doing so, then we are f we don't have that much unique products to process for each node. Like here, this is. I don't know, let's say for fashion, we have maximum 10,000 different products for each of our clients, and then we can simply feed them in memory and process them. So we were able to process most of, of our clients. Still, there are some clients with a huge number of, uh, of distinct products. And for those, we fought hard, but we couldn't find any solution. So for our first iteration, we simply decided not to drop them and not to compute any embeddings for them. So it was, it was a strong decision, but would say eh, it's better to have something than not to have any embeddings for anyone. And uh, we also used another trick to reduce the number of different products. So actually, we considered the uh, very unpopular products, like in each catalog, especially for the big partners, for the big uh, websites, they are really best sellers, and then you have the rest of the catalog where you have really unpopular products. And these popular products have two interesting proper uh, properties for us. First, there are many of them. If you look at the long tail, then they represent, actually the long tail, they represent a lot of uh, distinct product. Secondly, we don't think this, these are really relevant, because if they are not really popular, we don't think it's worth recommending them, and they won't perform well in our ads. So we decided to, uh, to drop them. And so it drastically reduced the number of events that we considered and made the computation even faster. So at this point, we were able to compute our embeddings for most of our clients, because we, by removing the very large clients, we remove only less than 1% of our clients. Still, we removed lots of the, around 40% of the, of the events. And, uh, yeah, so we were able to compute the embeddings for most of the clients. So we, well, we thought we were done. And then we realized that in the implementation of word 2 vec then what you have, you have plenty of parameters to tune. You have to tune the, the, the dimension of the, of the embeddings. You have to tune the number of epochs you use, like the number of time you go through your training data. And we had no idea on how to tune them, like they are default, but obviously we use different kind of data, so the default mode must be the uh, different. So there was no metric actually in the implemented in the, in the word 2 vec Spark implementation. So we decided to implement two of them. The first one is called LLH. So LLH stands for log likelihood. And actually it measures how well we predict the probabilities of the surrounding world. So exactly the case that I've described at the beginning. So we pick a word, and then we, we ask the algorithm to predict the probability of the surrounding worlds. And this is exactly what LLH measure. And this is pretty close to what we optimize in the, in the learn during the learning step. This is actually the metrics that we, that we optimize. And then on the other side, we have decided to use another metric called recall at k. Here, this is a measure that somehow measures how well we rank the product. So how does it work? We take a user timeline, we pick a product, and then, uh, so we pick its embedding, and then we consider the k nearest neighbors in the embedding space. We have a set of products, and then we consider the actual next event in the user session and then we try to figure out if it is in the k-closest product or not. So if it is in the k-closest product, then we count to 1, because we decided that somehow our ranking is good, and if not, we count to 0, and then we average stuff. So it really measures the r how well our embeddings are useful to rank the products. And this is actually much closer to the final goal that we have, which is predicting the next product to be able to have relevant recommendations. So given this, we had the metrics, and then we were able to bench some 
parameters, like the number of partitions that we use. Like it also has an impact on the quality because I have as I have told you, when you merge the data and you split the data, then somehow you lose some quality. <coughs> the number of epochs, then we figure out that actually one epoch for our case was enough, so we don't have to waste much uh, computation power on this. The learning rates, like how, well, how fast we decreased the displacement over the training set, and also the embedding simulation. So we were able to tune this, but at one point we thought, hey, Okay, we have tuned this data, so the LLH and the recall, we have improved them by X percent. But actually, is it really what we care about? So actually, as I told you, what we care uh, is about generating relevant recommendations, and how do we measure relevant recommendations? Is through clicks or through sales. So it's like we're generating better recommendations, we show them to the user, and we see whether people click on the products and then buy them together by them. And like so far we had no idea of how an improvement on the LLH or the recall at K was related to the actual clicks or the actual sales. So what we did is we took the opportunity of one of our A B test or online A B test to actually measure uh, for each of our clients the uplift in terms of click and in terms of sales and compare them to the quality of the to the of the related uh, embeddings like the LLH precision at K and we plot the correlation and we saw that there is a correlation between them. So uh, it's still kind of fuzzy. We are still in the process of trying to refine them and we'll refine the the correlation uh, over time. We'll see if they're really correct and it's still too early to decide which one of the true metric is the best for the online test, so we have decided to keep both for right now. But over the time, we are quite confident that we'll be able to tune our offline metrics so that they correlate well with the online metrics, and then we can do much more offline work, and which costs less than an actual A-B test. So, so far, so good. We are able to tune our parameters. We had uh, a nice implementation, then we had a nice distributed algorithm, plus a huge cluster. So well, we thought we were done, and then we had these embeddings, and well, everything was fine. And this is when uh, something kind of surprising happens, like we had good algorithm, good infrastructure, etc. It's like the data betrayed us. It's like uh, we, I was, well, everything was running fine, and I was working on the next iteration of the embeddings. And the idea then was to try to improve them by uh, combining them with the description of the product. So there was uh, our, some of our researchers had done some research, like you can have the user sessions and you can also have uh, mix them with the description of the products and try to improve the relevance of the embedding. So I was trying to implement this and this I noticed that I couldn't reproduce the uplift that m uh, our researchers had on their own data sets. So I tried to dig into a little bit and try to understand uh, what was happening. And at what point, I figured out that for one specific client, I decided to plot the evolution of the LLH with the, the number of samples that we use in our training sets. And this is what I got. So here, this is the learning process. And here, this is the LLH. So here, we see that it increases. And then at some point, then it decreases. And this is completely unexpected. So as we are trying to optimize for the LLH, we would have expected like to have a really smooth curve going up, up, and then asymptoting or slightly increasing till then. So well, this is was really surprising. And then I checked for other website, and I figured out that I had many different clients having the same behavior. So then I had a closer look at the data and realized that actually the data that we use, these user sessions, is actually very different from the NLP uh, data that is usually used with word 2 vec For instance, well, you have much less variety in each user session that you have in a sentence. Like usually you have a, a someone looking for, I don't know, red red clothes and then it looks for red t-shirts and then for red trousers but 
you only have T-shirts and trousers in, in, in his user sessions. Like, whereas for NLP, you have much more variety. Like you have f in each sentence, you have a word, you have some nouns, some adverbs, etc. And because of this, like imagine that we had a user fan of red clothes. So he has a user session, and then uh, we pick this user session first. So we are trying to we are going to group red items together. And then we are going to process the data over and over. And then uh, new, new uh, timelines. And as I've told you, we have a decreasing schemes. Like over the time, we decrease the size of the update. So it means that we, have, we will have grouped the red items together. And then it will be somehow too late to ungroup them with the time because uh, the, the learned representation is actually really dependent on the order of the timelines that we, that we had. So uh, we were somehow overfitting for the first data, and then for the uh, data afterwards, it was not the case. So we thought, OK, we think we have this issue. How can we tackle this? Like The whole problem here is the order in which we process the data. So we thought, hey, uh, we should shuffle the data somehow. The point is like, the way the algorithm work, like what the way I've described them, is like we split our sentences, we shuffle them across the network and across the nodes, then we process each sentence, and then we generate the pairs, like the pairs of products, like the 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 central words, and then we the words for which we try to predict the 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 the, the one we try to predict, and then we feed word to back with this. We f we thought, hey. We could actually have all the user timelines, generate the pairs, shuffle them, and then feed what to back with it. And this way, we'll be sure that the pairs are completely run, uh, shuffled. And then for the, the pairs generated by the red clothes fan, then it will be spread over the whole data set. And then we won't have this overfitting scheme. And we did, we did it. And this is actually what we obtained. So. This is a much better looking shape. This is much closer to what we had expected. It's look, well, this is an actual curve, and it looks like a notebook curve, actually. And so this is the quality increase, and then we checked it on different clients, and it was fixing everything. So we thought, hey, we, sh we, well, we found the solution. The point like here is that it takes almost six times longer than for the previous iteration. And why so? It's because we generate the pairs before the shuffling step. And actually, when you generate the pairs, like you add some redundancy, it generates much more volumes. And it means that you have much more data to shuffle. And so we couldn't afford it. So even if the quality was better, we had to find another solution. And then we thought, OK, we know what the problem is. We know that it comes from the ordering of the pairs, but we know that we cannot generate the pairs upstream. So we thought, what about mixing the two schemes, actually? What we can do is uh, we can split the data, like the way we did before, uh, shuffle them. But here, instead of processing all the sentences, one after the other, in, inside uh, one partition, we could read a batch of data, a batch of user sessions, generate the pairs from them, shuffle them in memory, and then feed what to back with this, update our weights, and then use another batch of data, etc., etc. This way, we could have reduced the correlation between the, uh, between the consecutive pairs. So this is what we did, and this is what we obtained. Like The curve is here much better looking. It's like we have a huge increase. Then we well we have an asymptote and then reaching the, the maximum. And if you look at look at the absolute value, then this is slightly the quality is slightly lower than for the previous case, but this is okay. And uh, well we had a, a small uh, decrease. And here what's also interesting is like you see these bumps. This actually corresponds to the time when we change the batch. So we, we generate a new batch, and then we see a decrease, etc. And then this is nice to, to see this. Still, the quality was not optimal, and we thought we could do better. So what we did is what we benched 
this parameter about how the size of the batch is that we had to use. And then we thought that we could use, well, the larger the batch is, the, the more shuffling you do, but then you have a limit about the memory that you use because you cannot shuffle all the, all the partition. So we thought a nice trade-off. And uh, this is what we obtained. Like here we have only what, two, two and a half batches. And this is really close to the ideal, uh, to the ideal case that uh, we have seen before. And if you look at the quality, this is we have a minimal drop of quality uh, when you do this. So yeah, so far we had solved this issue and we checked on several clients and the problem was fixed for most of them. So this is where we stand now. So we have uh, this uh, into production. We have A-B tested this. We have really promising results for now. And uh, what I wanted to share with you here is a few lessons that I consider important in this uh, experiment. Uh, the first lesson is that you don't have, you don't have to fear trade-offs. Trade -offs. Actually, you have to embrace them. Like here in this situation, there are many, in this use case, there are many situations where we had to do trade-offs. Like we had to drop some of our clients to make the whole thing work. We had to trade the quality uh, versus the, the learning time to have something acceptable, etc. And this is okay. When you deal with such large amount of data, then it's somehow okay to remove part of it or to skew slightly the data. To get some result, this is not ideal, but something is better than nothing. The second point that I would like to share with you is like you have to measure everything. It's like you have to have relevant metrics, and these are these metrics that allow you to do trade-offs. If you try to change the parameters without uh, having any quality metrics or performance metric, then you don't do trade-offs. You're going blindly and you're modifying your algorithm blindly. And one thing which is important to here to notice also is that you also have to challenge your metrics. Like you have to consider different, uh, different ones and then to try to understand what they capture well and that what they don't capture well. And then you also have to ask yourself, uh, are they really correlated or related to the final goal that I'm trying to achieve? So this was the second lesson. And the third lesson that I want to share with you is like you have to play with your data. Like even if you have very good metrics and then you have processed everything uh, nice and sweet, then at one point there are you there are bugs in your issue the in your algorithm. There are always bugs uh, and flow data, etc. And you, if you always use the same metrics, then you're not able to find them. So a nice way to find them is like trying to manipulate your data in different ways, try, try to use them for different use cases, implement new algorithm, and by doing this, you will ask yourself new questions, and then you'll be able to find flows into your algorithm, and then you'll be able to improve yourself on it. So that was the lesson, le the lesson that I wanted to share with you. Um, that's what I have for today. So I want to mention that well, if you want to work with large amount of data, machine learning, etc., then we're hiring. If you want to ask some questions, well, please ask me uh, offline. And uh, thank you for your attention. If, if you have questions, then you're welcome. Thank you for the talk. So we do have time for questions. Anyone? Uh, one of the thanks for the talk, by the way. Uh, first thing <laughs> cool, <laughs> was really interesting. One of the things you mentioned, and I'm, I've been wondering about, is that you have to train with this large amount of data. Yeah. And I'm wondering, have you tried sampling? Uh, not that I know. Well, I, I was not the only one doing some experiments, but uh, maybe we did the implicit assumption that we take from other stuff that we do that. Doing sampling usually reduces the, the quality, reduce the quality of the embeddings. But I don't think we have done it on our actual data. But from other stuff that we do, predictive stuff that we do, we have learned that sampling is often not that good, and we didn't try it on this to to the best of my knowledge. But could be an idea to speed up. Other questions? And we'll do that afterwards. So, uh, yeah. 
So uh, you mentioned that you have the initial set that you train the system on. So what happens if you want to add to the set? If you, if I want, sorry. If you want to add to the set, so if you want to add data to for the set to be to operate on larger volume of of initial data, oh, can can you add that after the initial um, okay. learning is done? Well, that's a good question. So something I forgot to mention is like we do this training every day. <coughs> so like to be able to be to have fresh data and to have relevant embeddings because like you know the correlation between the products they change over time sometimes two products get really correlated for one reason or, or one other so that's something also that we learned like we have to refresh it, to refresh it over the time so this is the easy way to uh, to add that to add some new data to to our data set still the question that is behind i think one well, one interesting question is like we retrain it and then the point is like when we retrain the data then the initial position are purely random also so the final configuration of the embeddings from one day to another may change drastically the assumption that we've made and we have to check at one point is like we uh, we we say even if the distribution of the embeddings in the space changes, we hope that the similarities computed between them won't change much. So this could be an ID, something we want to explore, trying to seed the, the training set, like uh, trying to, inside, uh, in s uh, instead of uh, sp spread the embeddings randomly at the very beginning, but use the current embeddings and try to update the weights uh, this way. So do you still use model averaging after all the splitting? And you said you have different word to vec per kind of domain or category of su subcategory of your products, right? Do you yeah. still use model averaging for um, like a user session? So like new user session comes in and do you have like a manager network that pick up the right word to vec or you combine it afterwards? How does it work? Well, the combination is currently purely averaging because we have not found anything better for now, but if you have any suggestions, then you're more than welcome. But yeah, we know that we have a huge of quality. I haven't not, uh, plotted here, but at the end, you have the, of the curves you know, I have plotted, like you have the merging step, and then you see a big drop, and then, well, it retrieves. So we know that we lose some quality uh, using this. It's the best solution that we have found so far. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, maybe the One mic? Second. Thank, thank you for the, the talk. It's very good. Corrosive. Corrosive. Okay. <laughs> thank you for the talk. Uh, can you tell us ab about the time scale? How much time is from one experiment to the next one to the next one? Is months, years, days? Uh, uh, for our experiments? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the whole project, I think, it started one year ago. So I think this is somehow a condensed view on what we did. So. For example, for the convergence issue, like it took us, well, I would say, from one to one to two months to actually figure out what to do. But it was the trickiest one, and then usually we try to, well, to do this on the sprint basis, like we use scrums, so like two weeks to for to solve the to solve the issues, and this is usually this, wor this works, and this is helped by the fact that we have this really large cluster, so we're able to to learn the embeddings. Oh well, in a matter of hours, so we can launch multiple experiments at the same time, get the result the day after, and then compare the results. Cool. Um, so you said it's like 300 billion words, or what, what you train on? Is it correct, or is it...? Three, no, it was uh, events. Yeah. No, it was wa 120 billion. So, ah, okay. Did you, did you normalize your, your input data? So, if for example, your French, so there would be accents. Uh, did you remove that and, and clean that? Sorry? The, when you have accent, like it's a different word, you, you, you would generate a different embedding for, for a word oh. with accent or with umlaut? Uh, no, actually, what we process here is like we process d uh, product IDs. So we okay. do, like at the beginning, I described word to vec which actually works with words. But yep. here, now we do this ah. analogy, let's say a product is a word, so yep. we only have one ID. Okay. So these, these are purely unix, we don't have this normalization issue. Ah, sorry, I missed it. But did you, did you also try fast text from Facebook? Uh, no, we didn't try. I've heard about it. Yeah, it's times, it's pretty fast. So I trained it with a few hundred thousand comments and on my laptop in a few, like half an hour for a few epochs. Okay, so yeah, yeah. we I've heard several times about this. This is definitely something we should try. 
Uh, any other question? Cool. Well, that, that was it. Uh, thank you, Simon. It was a really good talk. Thank you.